so much. It is very nice to be here, and I thank you for inviting me. I was here years ago. We were discussing, we don't know how many years ago um, it was, and it's nice to be back here. And as we get started, I will let you know that I am African American, which for me means that I've got ancestors for, from some part of Africa, but which culture, which um, area, I don't know. I'm still searching. I've also got ancestors from Scotland and Germany. Germany, but I wasn't born in Africa or Scotland or Germany. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Um, although I've traveled to all of those places doing my storytelling and also just because I love to travel in the world. Um, so I love that traveling. And I like to give you a little bit about my background as we get started because no matter where I go in the world, people look at me and they see the color of my skin. They look at the clothes I wear, some of the stuff I bring here, the stories I tell, the songs I sing, and they wonder where in the world I come from. So ancestors from where? Africa. Not Sweden, close. Scotland, there you go. Scotland and Germany, very good. I didn't tell you that I was born in New York City, grew up in Connecticut, and now I live in Providence, Rhode Island. And so, they, what, what's, what's that for? New York, Connecticut, or Providence? Are you from Providence? You go to Providence a lot. Okay, so when I leave here, I will be returning home to Providence. <laughs> nice. But I want to start uh, our time together with a song that I learned from a friend of mine. You know, when I, um, we will tell stories that come from African American history, but I always like to start by making a connection with Africa. Because that's the root, and that's the place of origin. No matter what our mix is here on this, uh, Sure, our root is Africa. And when I was growing up, I didn't learn very much about Africa. And most of the stuff I learned was not very positive. I know that that's really different now. Um, but that is the reason that I like to start with something that comes from Africa. So I have a friend who's from Malawi. And in Malawi, if you speak Chichewa, when you greet one another, you don't say hello. You don't say hi, you don't say que pasa, you don't say what's up. If you speak Chichewa, when you greet your friends, you say da kuona. Try that. Da kuona, da kuona. And what it means literally is I see you. I see you. Oh, can you imagine? Huh? If that's the way that we actually greeted one another, by saying, I see you. And I was struck by that because that's also the translation of the Zulu greeting in South Africa. When they say, Saubona, it literally means the same thing. It means, I see you. So my friend Masanko Banda from Malawi, who speaks Chichewa, taught me this song that they would sing. Uh, when he was growing up, and it is a greeting song. So since our village is gathering here, oh lovely, they're all coming in. So we'll learn this song, and then we'll uh, be able to move into some of the stories. So this is the song he taught me. It goes like this. Da kuona, da kuona, da kuona, moni. Pretty simple, right? All right, so I'm kind of one-armed here, but we put our arms at our eyes like this. So put them up here to the eyes. You can use two arms. And we say da kuona, try it there. Da kuona, very nice. Then we go to the heart. Da kuona, try that. Da kuo na, very nice. Then out in front of us, da kuo na, good. And then we do this, moni, moni. And that is a sign of respect. When you're greeting someone, you look at them and you clap three times. Not this kind of clap here, but one hand over the other. And it's a sign of respect. So we're saying moni is a sign of respect. Okay, so try it with me. Here we go. Da kuo na, da kuo na, da kuo na, moni. Try it again. Da kuo na, da kuo na, da kuo na, moni. Why y'all sound pretty good and you look good too. So since our village has gathered, now I want to invite you, because you sang so nicely to me, but since this is a greeting for all of us here, I invite you to turn to somebody near you. Look that person live in the eye. We're not looking at anybody dead in the eye today because I don't know where that expression comes from anyway. Somebody's going to tell me one day. But we're going to look our, our, our community live in the eye and we're going to greet them with this song of I see you 
and greet you with respect. Go for it. Da kuona, da kuona, da kuona, mo. Turn to someone else. Da kuona, da kuona, da kuona, mo. Turn to someone else. Lock eyes. Da kuona, da kuona, da kuona, mo. Back to me. Da. Nice. Da. Good. Da. Mo. Yeah, give yourselves a hand. All right. All right. Speaking and singing a little to Chewa here today. All right. I'm going to start with an African folk tale, um, which I tell a lot. And then we'll do some other things. But I do this always. Well, not always. Sorry, Herb. You know this story. Probably. Oh, well. Whatever. Whatever. You'll hear it again. Uh, well, no one else does. They might. It is a story that explains why I tell stories from history. And it's an African story. It comes from Liberia. Why it is important for us to tell the stories of those who are no longer here. And um, this is the, uh, uh, I bring this with me whenever I tell stories. Anybody know what it is? It's a tale. It's an animal's tale. And I bring it with me because all over the continent, in traditional gatherings, if you want to know who the important person is, the one who bears the knowledge or shares, keeps the culture, who does the healing, who is the uh, spiritual leader, who is the historian or the storyteller or the dancer, you will know because that person carries the animal's tale. And it's also carried by those who pass on the stories. So I want to tell you the story from Liberia, West Africa, about about why this is carried by the storytellers. And it goes like this. Once a long time ago in Liberia, West Africa, there was a man and he was a hunter. And he had a wife and they had a lot of children and his wife was pregnant. She was going to have a baby. Now one day this man said to his wife, honey, I'm taking my hunting things and going into the woods and I'll be back in time for dinner, so please don't eat till I get back. And she said, all right. So the man took his hunting things and he went off into the woods and as soon as he was gone, the other children had to do their chores. And you know how that is about doing all your chores. And they had to sweep and, 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 and they had to gather the water and, 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 and so they would take their calabash down and fetch the water from the river and bring it back. And when they gathered up the water, then they had to help with the preparation of the meal. So the boys would go fishing and the girls would help with the pounding of the grain. And then they gave all the food to their mother and she made the most amazing meal. And when that meal was ready, the whole, well, I was going to say the whole family sat down to eat, but that's not true because father was missing. And the children sat there and they waited because they couldn't eat until father came back and they were starving and they were staring at their mother. Oh! And their mother took one look at the faces of her children and she knew that they were hungry. So she said, all right, it's late. We're supposed to wait for father to come home, but we won't. We'll eat. We'll sleep and your father will be back tomorrow. But when the next day came, father wasn't there, and the day after that arrived, and no father, and the days and nights turned into weeks, thank you, and the weeks turned into months, and before a year passed, something miraculous happened, something so amazing and incredible, they forgot all about father. You know what it was, right? What was it? What was the miracle? No, uh-uh. Well, the baby came. That's right. A little baby boy was born. <laughs> came screaming into the world. And you know how it is when there's a miracle of birth and everybody was so excited. Even the cool people would go up to this baby when no one was looking. Giggly, giggly, goo. And they'd wait for the baby to say, goo, goo, goo. And mother called this beautiful boy, it was a boy, she called him Pooley, and he had dark skin and dark eyes and dark hair on his head, and oh, he was precious. And pretty soon he could say some other words besides goo goo and gaga. He could say food and mama and, and, and bathroom. But I have to tell you the best day 
When Puli stood up on his own two feet for the first time in his life, and he took his first solo steps right up to his mother, and he asked his first question, Mama, where is my dad? And when she heard that, she said, that's a good question. I don't know where your dada is. He went hunting before you were born. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. And the older children were listening. And they said, Mother, we saw the path Father took, and we will go down that path, and we will find him and bring him back in time for dinner. No problem. And so the older children packed up some food, and they said goodbye to their mother and baby brother, and they headed right off into the woods. And they walked for a long time until they came to a place where the path was completely overgrown. And when they reached that spot, they couldn't go any further. They couldn't find a way through the trees, and they couldn't climb up over or go around. And so they thought they were going to have to give up their search. In fact, the children turned, and they started to make their way back home when one of them said, Wait a minute. I know how to get through here. Father and I used to explore here. Uh, uh, I want to show you what I know. And this girl got down on her stomach and started to wiggle like a snake underneath the roots of those trees. And her brothers and sisters followed her. And they wiggled and wiggled until they came out on the other side and they stood up in a clearing that I'm going to say was about as big as this section of the audience. And a little bigger than this side, but about that big, but definitely darker than this room we're in. I mean, not totally dark, but just that sort of eerie, shadowy darkness when everything looks alive. And so the children stood up in that clearing, and when they looked on the ground, they saw a pile of bones. And right in the middle of those bones was a human skull. And all around those bones, they saw broken and rusted hunting tools. And when they looked at the hunting tools, they recognized them as their father's hunting tools. Being smart young people, they figured that those bones must be their father's bones. And so they figured father must have been killed in the hunt. And we'd better bring these bones back to mother. So they walked up towards those bones. And then they reached down to pick up the bones. <laughs> wanted to touch them. They reached down and they jumped back and they reached down and they jumped back. They were terrified of those bones until one of the children said, wait, I know, I know how to put the bones together because father taught me about anatomy and watch what I can do. And this child got down on hands and knees and connected those bones from the toe bones to the feet bones to the ankle bones to the shin bones to the knee bones. Another word for knee bone. Anybody remember? You do? What is it? It's my favorite word. Huh? You know, patella, you never heard that? Y'all never heard that word? Patella, 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 patella. <laughs> and then they got to the thigh bones and the hip bones and stacked up all the vertebrae, one on top of the other. They got those ribs and put them around and got the shoulders and the arms and the fingers and picked up the skull and stuck it on top and guess what they had? Skeleton, there you go, yep. Great thing to bring home to your mother. <laughs> hey mom, we found dad. He has finally lost that weight you've been after him about. Ta-da! <laughs> they did not think that their mother was going to go for that. So they stood there staring at the skeleton, and then one child said, I know how to do something. Father showed me this, and I want to show you. And that child reached right down into the earth and picked it up and moved it around and said special words and snapped fingers. And there was Father in the flesh. He was tall. He was dark. He was handsome. Yeah. He even had the hair on his head. But he couldn't move or speak until one child said, wait, I know how to do something. Father showed me. Watch what I can do. And that child ran over and touched Father from the top of his head to his feet, said some special words and snapped fingers. And Father started to walk. Then Father started to dance. <laughs> And the children were dancing with their father. They danced and danced till they fell on the ground. They were so tired. And the last child said, wait, I could do something too. Watch me. And that child reached over and touched father's mouth. And father said, my children, how good of you to have come. Thank you for bringing me back from the land of the dead. Now let's go home to your mother. And so the children followed their father out of that place, and they were so excited. They wanted their mother to know that they were on their way. You know, but this is an old story.
worry. Nobody had a cell phone back then. You couldn't send a text message. You couldn't call ahead. So they had to sing a song to announce their arrival. And the song they sang, the words meant, I'm knocking, I'm knocking, I'm knocking. And it sounded like this. La, 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 la. Try it with me. And when the children's mother heard that, she ran to the edge of the village and she sang the answer back. And her words meant, come in. And it sounded like this. Moyo, 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 moyo. Moyo, moyo, la 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 la. Try it with me. Moyo, 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 la 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 la. Oh my goodness, you should have seen it. Mother and father ran together and they hugged and they kissed. They laughed and they cried. It was just like in the movies. And then father got to meet the baby. More hugging and kissing and laughing and crying. And then the whole family sat down to eat together and father told the story about what happened how when he rested against a tree after he'd eaten a meal he closed his eyes without checking the branches above his head fell asleep and that cat in the branch above him leapt down upon him and when he opened his eyes he tried to fight but that cat scratched and tore all the meat off of his bones and left him a pile there it was a gross story but father was a good storyteller and when he finished telling the story, he stood up and he said, now I'm going to shave my head and I will go to the hut and I will stay there for four days because that was the custom when somebody came back from the land of the dead. When I come back in four days time, I want the whole village to come. I want you to kill the fattest cow and bring me the cow's tail. Now, nobody knew why Father wanted the cow's tail, but he was back from the land of the dead, so they did as he asked, and Father took the tail, and he put it on a stick. Now, mine is on a piece of metal, and it's got grasses woven around it, like you might weave for a basket or, or, or a mat, but Father had piles of brightly colored uh, beads, like the ones on my wrists, and he also had beautiful shells and shiny pieces of metal, so he decorated his cow's tail, and not only was was it beautiful, but when he moved it around, it made music. And when he came out of that hut, four days later, the whole village was gathered, just like we are, and they were cooking and laughing and talking and eating and cooking and laughing and talking and eating and cooking and laughing and talking and eating. And Father was having a great time getting reacquainted with the village. He didn't realize somebody was staring at that tail until that somebody finally went up to him and said, excuse me. Excuse me, that's the most beautiful tail I've ever seen, and I wanted to know if you'd give it to me. And Father said, nice of you to ask, but no. <laughs> See, I've got plans for this. Each of my children did something to bring me back from the land of the dead. But I'm going to give this to the one child who was most responsible for doing so. Well, you know, once Father said that, that big mouth went running around the village. You can forget. Who, needs a, who needed Twitter back then? You know what I'm saying? It was just the earth. You know how it still works. The mouth still is really good, right? Word of mouth, still good. And pretty soon, everybody in that village was talking about who was going to get that cow's tail, including the children who were arguing. Me, I found the way through the window. Uh -uh, I put the bones together. Yeah, well, I made Father dance. <laughs> Finally, Father raised up that tail for peace and quiet he said I can't hear with everybody talking at once do you know who will receive this gift do you know the baby how many say the baby everybody oh you didn't what do you think who you're not sure how about the mother no I did say kid but sometimes people want to put in a vote for the mother okay share it Pooley, everybody's pretty well convinced Pooley, why? He asked where the father is. That's what father said. Pooley is the one who asked the question. Mama, where is my dada? And until he asked, you'd forgotten about me.
You'd given me up for dead and gone, so Puli come here. And so Puli walked up to his father, and his father gave him that tail. And Puli was little, he didn't know what to do with it. So he watched the cows, and he learned how to play cow really well. Moo! And when his big brothers and sisters got on his nerves, until his mother and father said, you better cut that out. <laughs> but every year, on the anniversary of his father's return, every year, on the anniversary of his father's return, when it was storytelling time, and they gathered together, Puli was brought right up close, and he was told the story about why he had been chosen to receive that gift. You know Puli heard that story so many times. <laughs> he could tell it himself after a while, backwards, forwards. He dreamed about it at night. He knew it in seven different languages. But when he was old, and when he couldn't really get around, Puli would sit outside with that tail. And the younger people would come and they would greet him. And he'd greet them back. And then they'd say, what's that? And he would tell them. And they'd say, well, where did you get it? And he'd say, well, if you have time, I've got a story. And they'd say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got time. We, we, we got time. And they'd sit right down, and Puli would tell the story of his father. And he would always finish by saying, so you see this. This reminds me, and I hope it reminds you, that no one is ever dead unless or until he or she is forgotten. And that's the story of the cowtail switch from Liberia for you. Hmm. Thank you. I kind of like being a little closer to you. Is that all right with you all? Since y'all didn't move up, is that okay with you? <laughs> Are you okay there? So um, I was thinking about this story, and then you know I'll probably tell you something else, but I wanted to tell you this. You might know it in some form. Um, but not that long ago, I was driving through Massachusetts, the other end of Massachusetts, near where I grew up, where Massachusetts meets Connecticut, Route 7 and Route 202. Do you guys know any of that area? Like Stockbridge and Great Barrington and Sheffield and all those parts of Massachusetts, which are really close to where I grew up. And I often will stop in a library when I'm there. You know, if I'm just like in a town, a small town, I like to go into the library. And so I went into the library um, in, I think it was Great Barrington, or it could have been Stockbridge. Stockbridge? Stockbridge. It's like right where Route 7 is. Stockbridge between Great Barrington and, see, here I go, not, not doing a very good job with my work here. But that's why I said I'm going to tell it to you anyway, because it's a work in progress, and then I'll tell you something I really know. <laughs> Anyway, I stopped in this town, which is either Great Barrington or Stockbridge, and I think it's Stockbridge. And um, I was reading some stuff on Elizabeth Freeman, Mumbet. You know anything about her? Oh, see? And here we are in Massachusetts, and we don't know anything about her. And, and I grew up not far from there and, like, didn't know anything about her. Elizabeth Freeman is credited as being one of the people whose court case outlawed slavery in Massachusetts in 1781. And this is what I can tell you about her story. It was April in 1781, and the weather was bad on this particular day. Now, Elizabeth was called Bet. Everybody called her that. And she was enslaved by the man, Colonel John Ashley. Now, Colonel John Ashley was a very important man in this town of Ashley Falls, named after him. Not only was he responsible for the founding of that town, Ashley Falls, but Colonel Ashley had done a lot to work on the Massachusetts Constitution, and he was very involved in everything happening that was political. Political. So all her life, since she was a little baby, just about six months old, well, that's when Colonel Ashley bought her from his wife's family so that he would have some property to raise up and to work in the home. Well, ever since she was six months old, Bet had been living in that family's house and learning to do the work. So all of her life, she had served the drinks and 
prepared the meals and taken care of the house and the family. And this day was no different. She was in the kitchen and she had a younger sister, Lizzie. Now Lizzie was never very well uh, physically. She always had some problems and so she was always getting in trouble by Mrs. Ashley. So Beth was in the kitchen and she heard this scream coming from the other room where the pantry was. And so without even thinking, she pushed through the door just in time to see Mrs. Ashley grab the hot shovel right out of the fire, raise it up over her head as if she was going to bring it right down on Lizzie, and without even hesitating, Bet moved right in between the blow and her sister and took that shovel to the bone on her arm. The blood spurted everywhere, and as soon as the blood spurted, Mrs. Ashley came to her senses. Oh, Bet, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, are you all right? And Bet said, I'm all right. And she turned and she walked out and she bandaged her arm. Not only was she all right, but Bet had made a decision in that instant. She bundled herself up and then she got her daughter. Everybody called her daughter Little Bet. Now, Bet had a husband and he had joined the war, the Revolutionary War efforts, and he'd been killed. So she hadn't seen him in a long time, but he had at least left her with this beautiful baby. And even though the weather was bad on this cold April day, Bet bundled up Little Bet and she bundled herself up and then she walked right out of Colonel Ashley's house and she headed towards the Housatonic River and she began to walk towards the town of Sheffield. She knew exactly where she was going. She went to Theodore Sedgwick's house and his business. Theodore Sedgwick was a lawyer and she had seen him many times gathered around the table at Colonel Ashley's house when they had discussed the Massachusetts Constitution and not only that, she had seen Theodore Sedgwick and all the other men gathered around in 1776 when they had actually read the Declaration of Independence and so bet not on the door and she heard a voice say come in and so she walked in and when Theodore Sedgwick saw her he was surprised bet what are you doing here what 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 happened and she said I'm here sir because I want to be free excuse me I'm here, sir, because I want to be free. Your Massachusetts Constitution says free and equal. All men are born free and equal. And I have heard that Constitution of the United States as well. And so I want to be free. It was as if a window in his mind was opened up. As if all of a sudden Theodore Sedgwick realized that the words that those white men had talked about around the table all that time might resonate for a black woman who was enslaved bet 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 this isn't about you sir your paper says free and equal and i want to be free well what happened bet she took off her cloak and she showed him her arm and she told him the story about what had happened with Mrs. Ashley and Theodore Sedgwick was trying to figure out what in the world to do when there was a knock on the door. When he went to the door, there was Colonel Ashley and his son and they said, come Bet, come back home now. Well, Bet looked at Theodore Sedgwick and he said, you have to go, Bet. You are his property. And so she bundled up her daughter and they left. But once they were gone, Theodore Sedgwick couldn't sleep because he had been pricked by what Bet had said to him. And so late at night and all during the day, he would pore over the law books, wondering what was this thing? Could she in fact be free? Now back at Colonel Ashley's, Bet was kept a close eye on. She was not allowed to leave the property. Colonel Ashley said, don't you go off the property, Bet. Do you hear me? They watched her very, very carefully. Now, Bet had spoken to Lizzie, her younger sister, and she'd also spoken to Brom, one of the black men who was enslaved on the property as well. She didn't know what would happen, but one day she was working and a knock came on the door and she opened it up and it was the sheriff. The sheriff said, are you Bet? She said, I am. Is Brom here? He is. Well, go get, the, go get uh, Colonel Ashley. And so Colonel Ashley came into the room and the sheriff presented him with some papers. The sheriff said, I've got a writ of replevin here. I've come to take your property. I've come for Bet and Brom. Well, when Colonel Ashley heard that, he said, no. They're not going. These are my property, and you need to give me some, some, some security, some bondage. I'm not, you need to come with another paper. 
And now the sheriff knew that it was true, and so he turned and he left. And a few days later came back with, a, with all the paperwork in hand, knocked on the door, and Colonel Ashley came and Mrs. Ashley came, and they said, Bet, haven't we treated you well? Yes. In fact, you have. Well, then why do you want to leave? Mrs. Mrs. Ashley said, I'm so sorry, Bet. I didn't mean it. I'm so sorry. And she said, I want to be free. And I want my daughter to be free, just like those things that you are fighting for and that my husband died for. I want to be free. Colonel Ashley said, if you go, Bet, where are you going to find work? And Brahm, if you go, where will you find work? I don't know, but I'm going. And so Bet took little Bet. And she walked out of that place, and they went down to the court, and, and all of the paperwork was filed. And Brahm was able to find some work, you know, because it, it, it was the summertime, and there was plenty of farm work to be done for a man. But where was Bet with the baby going to go? Theodore Sedgwick said, you can come, and you can stay here. And in August of that year, they went to the court and when they got to the court, Theodore Sedgwick was a bit nervous. <laughs> and Bet said, why are you nervous, sir? Well, I just don't know what's going to happen. She said, you don't need to be nervous because your law says, the Constitution that you wrote says, all men born free and equal. You just tell them what it says there. And they went into the court, and there was Colonel Ashley with his lawyers. And they went, and they presented their case. I don't know how long it took. But when the verdict came back, the court decided in favor of Bet. Elizabeth Freeman has been determined to be free. And not only that, she is awarded 30 shillings for the work that she has done for Colonel Ashley since the time she was 21 years old. Court dismissed. <sighs> Bet was free. And Brahm was free. Can you imagine? You know, she worked for Theodore Sedgwick and his family for a number of years. And then she got a place of her own. And she worked as a nurse and a midwife. And they say in that part of Massachusetts that many of the babies that were born were caught by Mumbet's hands, because by the time she was old, that's what they called her, Mumbet. <laughs> and the Sedgwicks, who had taken her into their family, loved her so much that if you go to the cemetery in this town, you look for what they call the Sedgwick Pie. It's in the old part of the cemetery, right off the main street. The Sedgwick pie. And all the Sedgwicks are, are buried there in this thing, you know, like a circle that goes out with the pie, you know? And right there in the midst of the family, you will find Mumbet's tombstone. Elizabeth Freeman, remember her name and tell her story. And that's a true story for you. <laughs> Don't you love it? Can't you just say, like, why didn't we know this? How come not everybody knows that? Did y'all know this? You see what I'm saying? So we have to tell that story. We have to say, hey, you know why Massachusetts and, and New England was, was leading the way for the abolition of slavery? It was because black people took it to court. Elizabeth Freeman, now she had to go with Brom because he was a man. Well, that's another story, right? <laughs> that's another story. Right? But that'll come later. But, you know, Paul Cuffey took it to court. People took it to court right here in this place, which is why slavery was outlawed in, in the northern colonies. Whoa! Go, girl. Go, girl. All right, let's finish up. Do we have time for one more to finish up with? Or you got to go? One more? All right. We'll do one more. We'll, what the heck? We'll do one more. Okay, and I guess I'm feeling women's spirit now since, you know, whatever. Uh, but I give you this, one of my favorite stories of somebody you probably have heard about, uh, Zora Neale Hurston. Yeah? Yeah? You heard of her? Okay. 
Good, then everybody will know something. Zora Neale Hurston was the first African-American woman to collect and write down the stories of African-American people. Not only did she write the stories uh, as a folklorist here in this country, but she also went to Haiti, where she was initiated into Vodun, and she wrote a lot about the traditional uh, practices of Vodun in Haiti. Um, and she wrote uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God, which you know Oprah produced as a movie, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, but let me tell you a story which is from her life, probably a little mix of fact and fiction because that's how she lived and expressed herself. <laughs> but I love it. It's about how she fell in love with stories. And it goes like this. It was over a hundred years ago and Zora Neale Hurston was living, growing up in the all-black town of Eatonville, Florida. And when she got to be old enough, her mama would say, here, Zora, take this money and go down to Joe Clark's store. Bring me back milk, butter, eggs, whatever her mama needed. And Zora would say, all right. And she'd grab a hold of that money and she'd run out of the house quick because she was finally old enough to do a job on her own, didn't need anybody to go with her. And she'd race out of the house, across the porch, down the stairs. She'd run across the yard and when she got to the gate, she'd pull over open the gate, turn left down the dirt road, and run so fast she left a cloud of dirt behind her. When she got to Joe Clark, she'd race up the steps across the porch, pull open the door, go inside, pull up the things her mama wanted, hand it over the money, pick up the packages, push back through that door. <sighs> and when she got on the porch for the second time, Zora would stop for the first time since she left her house. <laughs> you know why? Because all the old people were sitting up on that porch. Oh yeah! She knew they were old. All she had to do was look at them, and she could tell because if had their hair, it was more salt colored than pepper. <laughs> and when she looked at their faces and they smiled, oh, they had wrinkles in their skin that made it look to Zora like they must have been around when God made the dirt. <laughs> But the real reason she knew they were old was because they didn't go to work anymore. They'd sit up on Joe Clark's porch all day, every day, and they'd just hang out there and drink fresh squeezed lemonade, and they'd chew some tobacco, because yes, they did back then, and they would sit around and they would tell lies. <laughs> Stories. Some of them remembered snatches of songs from Africa that their grandparents had passed along. Da ku o na, da ku o na, da ku o na, mo ni. Some of them knew all about how come the turtle had cracks in his back and why the dog said, ow! Some of them knew about the days of slavery and they talked about it. And Zora loved to hear what those old people had to say. That's why she would stop on the porch. But whenever she stopped, whoever was talking would stop and say, Zora, your mama didn't send you down here to be lallygagging. Now you get those packages and you get on home. And Zora would say, yes, ma'am, <laughs> or yes, sir, depending on who was telling her to get. Now, on this particular day, Zora, or, or any day when they told her to go, she was never in a hurry to leave. So she would, you know, turn herself invisible, like <laughs> by moving as slowly as she could. You know what I mean? She'd move so slowly that by the time she got to the bottom of the steps, those old folks would forget about her, which was perfect, because then she could sneak around the back side of the porch, and she could scrunch herself down, and she could worm through this hole that was big enough for her, and she could sit underneath that porch while the old folks were talking above her heads, which was great, because she could listen till her heart and head were full of stories, and nobody knew she was there. She loved days like that. But then she had these other days when her mama would say, <clears throat> Don't you leave the yard. I don't want you out of my sight. You hear me? <sighs> yes, ma'am. She hated those days. She'd wander around inside the yard and inevitably get down by the gate, and then she'd look over the gate. <laughs> Do you know the world is humongous on the other side of the gate when you are told you can't get out? <laughs> and so Zora was looking one day over that gate, and she got an idea. Hey, Mama said I couldn't go out of the gate, but Mama didn't say I couldn't climb up on it. <laughs> yeah. So she climbed up on that gate and she shimmied over to the gate post and she felt like the queen of the universe. She was waving at the birds and giving orders to the bugs. And one day when she was sitting up there, she heard this car drive by. Now cars, not like today, so many we can't count them. Excuse me, a hundred years ago, not so many cars and certainly not in that teeny tiny town of Eatonville, Florida. So when that car got close, she hollered at it. Yoo Orlando, can I go a piece of the way with you, please? 
And with her big mouth yelling like that, the car stopped, and these fancy dressed people got out. And Zora said, uh, if you take me a piece of the way with you, I could keep you company, because nobody had radios in their cars back then. Forget about a DVD player in the back seat of the car or, you know, a portable one. No! She said, um, I could sing you a song. I got a song. Mr. Rabbit, Mr. Rabbit, your ears are mighty long. Yes, my friend, they were put on wrong. Every little soul must shine, shine, shine. Every little soul must shine, shine, shine. <laughs> And when she finished singing that song, those fancy dressed people clapped their hands and the lady with the gloves opened her purse and she took out some coins and she handed them over to Zora. Oh, thank you. Excuse me? I can't go a piece of the way with you? Oh, no, you're right. My mama and daddy would be real mad if I got in a car with some strangers. All right, well, you have a nice time and I'll sing to you or tell you a story when you come back. Bye! That was a good day, too. But most days weren't that good. And one day, she was sitting up on that gatepost, bored as could be, tired of giving orders, and she looked at those birds. No fair birds. You know how to fly. You can go anywhere you want to in the world. I wish I could fly. Hey, I bet I could if I try. <laughs> you guys have probably got some flying stories that maybe you'll share on your way out today. I know I have my own flying stories, you know, like uh, the big rock between my house and Heather Asman's house and the old ponchos that we used to make, you know, back in the 70s and the first time those ponchos came around, like the flying nun. And, uh, and well, Zora didn't know anything about that, but there she was on that gatepost. And she scrunched herself down and she jumped up as high as she could and threw out her arms and started flapping and woohoo! and landed kaboom in the dirt. But it didn't hurt, and it was fun. So she jumped over and over and over until her daddy came and said, Zora, what are you doing? Get up. She was covered with dirt and mud. He said, this is not proper behavior for a young lady. Girls are supposed to be neat and clean and quiet. I'm taking you inside. Your mama's going to teach you how to behave. I'm not having a wild child jumping up and down off of a gatepost. Now, come on. And when they got inside, Zora's daddy left her with her mama in the shoes. I'm sorry, Mama. What you sorry about, baby? Well, I'm sorry that, that I was jumping up and down off of the gate post, acting like a wild child. And it's good she was looking down, because she might have caught a smile creeping up on her mama's face. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> but her mama got it together. And her mama said, Zora, look at me. Yes, ma'am. Tell you what. You got to go to school, or we go visiting. I'm going to make sure your hair is combed and your clothes are clean. But when it's your time, Zora, as long as you're not hurting anybody and long as you're not hurting yourself, you got to be who you got to be. But Daddy told me not to jump off and down off at the gate post and act like a wild child. I heard what your Daddy said. But I'm going to tell you something different. <gasps> you are? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you want to jump off of that gate post? You go right ahead. What? Mm-hmm. In fact, you go ahead and jump at the sun if you want to. You might not land up on it, but at least you'll get your feet off the ground. And as soon as Zora heard her mama say that, she knew her mama understood something in her that she didn't even have words for. She hugged her mama, her mama hugged her back, and they had so much fun together. Her mama was a seamstress and would use those empty spools of thread and the leftover fabric, and they'd make dolls and puppets and create these wonderful stories and sing together. But when Zora was a teenager, her mama got sick and her mama died. And when her mama passed away, Zora felt like the rug of life had just been yanked out from underneath her feet, and she didn't know how she could keep standing without her mama, so she grabbed a hold of her mama's words. And she carried them everywhere she went when a theater troupe came into town and she decided that's what she wanted to do. And people said, colored girl, because, you know, that's what they called African Americans back then. Colored girl from Eatonville can't travel with a the theater troupe. She didn't listen to can't because she had her mama's words. And she packed a little bag and traveled all over the country with that theater troupe. When she got to Washington, D.C., she met people who went to college. And she said, I want to go to college. And when some people said, colored girl from Eatonville can't go to college, she didn't have time for can't. And she went to college in New York City. And when she got there, it was the time of the Harlem Renaissance. And there was jazz music. Oh, it was wonderful. And she met poets like Langston Hughes and County Cullen. And they wrote books. And she decided 
decided she wanted to write a book. And some people said, colored girl from Eatonville can't write a book. But she had no time for can't because she had her mama's words. And she got in a car and drove down to Eatonville, parked that car. You know where? Right next to where? Close. That's a good idea. Not the fence post. The store. Mm -hmm. Joe Clark's store. And when she got there, those old people were sitting up on that. Zora! Girl, is that you? Come on up here. Where you been? It's been a dog's age. Come on up here. And they pulled up a pickle barrel and they had her sit right down and they gave her some fresh squeezed lemonade with the right amount of sugar and they gave her a little bit of chewing tobacco. And knowing Zora, she probably chewed it. And they let her sit up there for days and 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 days while they told their stories. Those are the ones she wrote in a book, Mules and Men, the one I told you about. Then a whole lot of books from her wild imagination, from her own life, from her scholarly research. You might read about her, you might read one of the books she wrote, or maybe remember the story, or at least remember what gave her the strength to do and be everything she imagined. Her mama's words. And we got to all jump at the sun. Might not land up on it, but we will get our feet off the ground. And that's the story of Zora Neal Hurston for you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out to hear some stories in celebration of Black History Month. I call it Black History since we started in Africa. You know, it's a little more inclusive. And um, pass the stories on. They live because we tell them. So thanks very much. You're very welcome.